talk about the overall um, Medicare Advantage market. We'll look at the winners um, in the different markets uh, from the standpoint of market share. We'll also get into um, who were the top performing plans by state. So you can see like which, which plans uh, did what in different states, which states had the highest enrollment, lowest enrollment, and then get into um, the Part D uh, benefits. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll finish um, with uh, some trends to look for in the future, You know what to look for, how to prepare yourself for this annual enrollment period, kind of what I expect the market to look like uh, in going into 2025. Um, we'll talk about legislation and regulations, what the impact of these uh, will be to the best of my knowledge. Uh, this is where I uh, dust off my crystal ball and try and you know, divine like what I think it's gonna look like. Um, in the past, it's been you know, always interesting. I like to look back at the prior year, uh, this speech and see like uh, how well I did. So I'm not, I mean, if you guys wanna do that, you can. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I did miss a little bit on the commission, my guess on commissions last year. But uh, other than that, I think it was pretty it was pretty spot on. So I'll do my best to, to give you some some guidance as to how to prepare yourself and your business so that for the upcoming uh, 2025 annual enrollment period, you'll know what to expect. You'll know how to best uh, serve your your customers, which is kind of why we're all here. Right. So let's get into your sales results for 2023, uh, starting off with Medicare supplement. Um, this was uh, by far the best year we've ever had in the, in the med sub space, uh, over 43 million in production for 2023. Um, we, never, we never cracked uh, 40 million in the history of the company. And I can remember um, not that many years ago when we broke 20 million and I thought that was like, that was just an awesome number, especially when you consider the fact that Medicare supplement has not been growing quite as fast as uh, the Medicare Advantage business to see 20% uh, growth this year was, uh, or this past year is really spectacular. So we really appreciate that. Um, you know, we've always held the view that, you know, as agents, we should do what's best for our customer so whether that's a Medicare supplement and a Part D plan or a Medicare Advantage plan, or if they have you know, an employer group plan or something like that, sometimes that's not doing anything. So, um, so we really, um, really preach the value of doing what's best for the customer. And we're happy to see that that Medicare supplement is still uh, a viable option for a lot of individuals that are, are looking for that protection or looking for that network. Medicare Advantage, um, this is a full year. So this is all of the uh, 2023 effectives. This doesn't include uh, any of the business that we wrote during the annual enrollment period from October 15th through December 7th. So, um, so it's actually like a little bit of the work that you did two Octobers ago, right? So it, was, uh, it started in, in um, October of, of 22 and ran through um, November of 23, so it's just for those effective years, 120,000 enrollments, a um, little over 120,000 enrollments for the full year, so that's a spectacular number. You might recall if you were here last year, we broke 100,000, so that was pretty exciting to see uh, that uh, clearing that 100,000 mark and going over 120,000 is just a spectacular result. So. Very much appreciate all your work uh, on the Medicare Advantage side. Uh, we're seeing not only uh, great enrollment during the annual enrollment period, but we're seeing better month over month uh, enrollment. Uh, for example, I just looked at the month of February 2024 uh, relative to uh, last February 23, and our production in that month was up 50%. So you'll see just uh, continued opportunities for year-round sales. So this is not just a annual enrollment period business anymore. It's really becoming a year-round opportunity for our agents, which is so exciting. Uh, in Part D, uh, we were down. That, I think, had a lot to do with, um, with some of the changes, some plans being non-commissionable. And this was not, this 
took into effect the prior year annual enrollment period. The good news, which why don't I jump to the next slide since I have good news, we'll jump there. You'll see that our Part D business uh, rebounded uh, this annual enrollment period. So this is uh, the 2023 annual enrollment period. This just includes 1-1 2024 effective dates. So just in the annual enrollment period, we came a whisker from hitting 62,000 enrollments for this. So I think you guys should give yourselves a round of applause for that <laughs> performance. And that was up 31% uh, over the prior year. You'll see in some of the future slides when I get into the industry, you know, the overall industry is growing, you know, in the single digits, um, high single digits for Medicare Advantage. Uh, it's growing in the low single digits for um, Medicare supplement, and it's a little bit negative uh, on the PDP space. So to see 31% growth um, is just incredible. And then, as I mentioned before, even though we were down last year, uh, we were up 20% in the Medicare um, Part D space. So quite a bit of movement in the, uh, in the MAPD space in addition to doing that. So all total, almost 90,000 enrollments that's a lot of work in uh, six and a half weeks, right? <laughs> That's quite, a, quite an annual enrollment period, and, uh, and we really appreciate everything you all have done. So let's go into some of the things that were happening at Ritter in, um, in 2023. Um, we increased our, we pretty stable as far as our headcount. Uh, we had added five uh, employees this past year. So we're up to 275 employees. We continue to have a focus of like uh, our home office in Harrisburg, where we do a lot of the administrative work um, as far as contracting, uh, new business, um, software development, things like that. <clears throat> and then having the philosophy of having the local, uh, the, the uh, regional markets, so we have local sales people in the field. So all of our offices I have listed there across the United States. That continues to be our focus. We really feel that the best way um, to be able to interact with agents is to have individuals who are in that market, who understand that market, who can answer questions that are specific to what you need. Uh, so we really pride ourselves on being able to provide that uh, grassroots support in the field as well as having like a great staff back in Harrisburg as well to be able to support the overall organization. So these are some of the uh, plans that we added in uh, 2023. We have a pretty, uh, pretty full portfolio, so not as many additions. We've had other years uh, where, we've, where we've added some more CDPHP um, up in the Capital District in New York. Um, I was very excited that we were able to add the Part D plan for Cigna. That was always something that I was asking and asking for and really had a good, uh, a good enrollment for Cigna on the PDP side. Uh, Pacific Source out west, uh, Woodman Life is for Medicare Supplement, and then a number of uh, plans on the ACA side. I'm not going to spend a lot of time this afternoon talking about ACA, actually, you know, not you know, very little really. Um, but we are really expanding our ACA business. This is probably the fastest, one of the fastest growing uh, product lines that we have. Uh, one of the things that I found kind of funny is we did add Health First health plans in Florida. We actually have a Health First in New York, and those are totally different companies. They've got the, the same name, but different companies. But the Health First in New York has a space between Health and First. So that's how you know the difference. That's not a typo. <laughs> so that's the, otherwise, other than the being in Florida, that's the only way that you would know. So uh, quite a few additions in New York State, uh, a lot of additions in Pennsylvania, and also in other states like Ohio, Delaware. So we're really rounding out that portfolio on the ACA side. Uh, I'm going to read all these to you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know, one of, one of the philosophies, like as I mentioned earlier, one of the philosophies that we've always had is that we really have a strong desire to help you find the best plan for your, for your customer. Um, a lot of times um, it could be a national plan, but a lot of times it's a regional plan as well. Um, so we work extremely hard to build 
as comprehensive a portfolio as we can. Um, on the Medicare Advantage side, so that you have choices, whether it's DSNP, PPO, HMO, um, even if it's a Medicare supplement and a Part D plan. Um, so maintaining this portfolio of companies has really been um, a focus for us. And it's really so that you can provide the right product for that customer. So always, always making sure that you give them the right plan. And we found that if you put them in the right plan, they're more likely to stay. They're more likely to refer more customers to you. So it's really a win-win for, for everyone. It's a great thing to do for the, for the client, but it, it also is good for you because one, they stay in the plan, you continue to get your renewals, and two, um, they're more likely to, to refer other people to you as well. So very proud of that slide. Uh, some of our Medicare supplement uh, relationships in bold, I put the plans, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, carriers on the list there, um, but those that are over a million in production, uh, I put in bold for you. So there's a few uh, new plans that actually went from uh, being like regular font to being bold font in, uh, in 2023. And that's, these are the companies that made up that $43 million of production. Primarily uh, the ones that are in bold are the ones that were um, the ones that generated all that, all that production this past year. So technology, um, one of the major, um, I, I kind of feel like um, every year when I give this speech, there's always something that, uh, that came from CMS that I have the opportunity to talk to you about. Um, I'm looking forward to the year maybe when I don't have anything to talk about, but last year, it was that the word Medicare, um, you know, we had to remove the, the word Medicare from, um, from our marketing website. So uh, for many years, I was, would tell you, you all about Medicareful, uh, the great site that we had to uh, allow you to enroll your customers in MA and uh, Part D plans. This past year, probably one of the biggest projects we had for all of 2023 was to um, reprogram and kind of uh, reskin the Medicareful website and convert it into Shop and Enroll uh, for the 2024 annual enrollment period. Um, so we have probably around 40, uh, 40 insurance companies that are um, that file that website with CMS uh, or that we file and that they opt in to our filing. Uh, with CMS. So it is no small task, not only from a technology perspective to provide them with like the sample site so they can QA the website and then eventually opt in, but also from the compliance side to make, to be constantly communicating with these 40 insurance companies to make sure that they're all satisfied with the with the filing, they're all opted in, they all approve, and that everything happens on October 1st. And of course, you know, all these companies are, are quite, uh, quite busy with their own filing, so you're not always like at the very top of their list, but uh, we've pushed really hard. So kind of shout out to our compliance team for doing a great job <coughs> this year, and also to our technology team for redesigning that website and making it that we really didn't miss a beat in, uh, in 2023 for this annual enrollment period. And we got all of our plans um, opted in. So you can see we're continuing to increase the number of PDP and, and, and MA plans. So we're up to 34 MA carriers and seven PDPs. And I was talking, uh, we had a carrier in our office, um, I think it was last week, and talking about the very first year we had Medicareful, we started off with uh, two PDP plans, and I think we wrote about 150 or 200 Part Ds, and it was a lot of work <laughs> to get that to get that website up and running for uh, uh, for for that first year. And I I distinctly remember like sitting in my office one time just saying, "Was it worth it? Was it really worth all that effort to?" Right, you know, 150 or 200 Part D plans on a electronic enrollment website. But you will see that 
we achieved quite a bit of growth. So we went from writing 250 apps that first annual enrollment period to this annual enrollment period surpassing 250,000 enrollments on the Shop and Enroll platform. So I think we made the right decision uh, in the long run, but you can see that continued growth and you know pushing pushing on towards you know going past 300,000. So it's been uh, it's been quite a run. It's been you know very useful um, in the past few years as you know things have moved from kind of a paper world to more of a of an online world, electronic world. Makes it a lot easier for your consumers, a lot easier for you um, to be able to get that uh, to be able to get that enrollment effectuated uh, quite efficiently. So this has been this was a slide that I was uh, that I was happy and I was able to reminisce about that first year <laughs> and wondering like what did I just do <laughs> these are the uh, these are all the carriers that we have uh, enrollment um, on the shop and enroll website so we actually have more carriers than just this um, that di are display only like some carriers may not opt in for the enrollment piece so we have more than just this list but these are all the carriers that we have available uh, that you can do f straight through enrollment uh, through our shop and enroll website. Some of the things that we've accomplished, um, you know, that first, these bullets on it, they're not sized based on like how difficult they are. So they're all like the same size, but some of them were, were quite a bit harder. Um, we added uh, an admin page for agents so that you can check, kind of check off and manage your own shop and enroll site. We've added some HRA links, um, multi-factor authentication, which you know the is really a lot of it is driven by the carriers wanting to uh, to make sure that we have the right security and technology, uh, so that your customers and their customers are are secure. Uh, we don't want any data breaches or having to do any reporting in that regard. Uh, having admin accounts for agencies was a big ask, so now we have that uh, available. Uh, we did a lot with electronic contracting. A lot of it is uh, is behind the scenes, but uh, for the first time, we now have a carrier that is a straight through electronic contracting. It doesn't actually even touch our uh, our contracting team. If the if the contract is clean, it goes right from the from our website right through and goes right into the uh, insurance company. So that was a first for us uh, that we just rolled out. We did an entire rewrite of our whole contracting system, and we added quite a bit of um, support to the CRM uh, for you to be able to do scope management. I know that's a big, uh, you know, that's a big uh, effort every year for you, um, and also to allow you to attach uh, scopes to submissions uh, was another enhancement in 2023. Uh, looking ahead to 2024, um, a lot of things and. A whole lot of things behind the scenes that you kind of help us operate more efficiently, you know, help our staff serve you better. Uh, but that may, it may not be, you know, something that you would see every day. But a lot of that happens uh, behind the scenes as, as well. So more HRA uh, integration, going direct to carrier as opposed to just having links, um, adding more control for email preferences. So. I know we send out a lot of uh, marketing material to keep you kind of up to date as to what's going on, but giving you the ability to kind of hone in to like the products that you want to hear more about. Um, this year, adding links to CSG and to the platform, the integrity platform, which would include both Medicare Center and Life Center. And then um, adding some flexibility. This was something that a number of agents asked is, would we be able to run a quote if we put, you know, all the all of our uh, clients' drugs in the plan? But let's say we we didn't want to quote one or two drugs. Uh, the way it is now, you actually have to like take those drugs out and add them back in and rerun the quote. Uh, in the future, we're looking at having it so you can put in all the drugs for that customer, and then you can either like select all and it'll quote all of the drugs, or if you wanted to like swap out a brand for a generic or Maybe this is a drug that they may not want to take or look at different options of what the cost of these drugs would be. It would give you more flexibility than having to delete it and then re-add it and then rerun it. You can do it much more simply. So that was a great suggestion that came from our agents, and we're going to 
um, look to implement that in 2024 before the annual enrollment period. So now we're going to get into um, some stats for, um, for the Medicare market overall. Uh, so you can see, um, talked about the Medicare Advantage market. These are all individual, or the top two are individual, and then the bottom is our employer plans. Uh, so as of January 1st, we had 9% year-over-year growth um, in the Medicare Advantage market. You can see the individual Part D market shrank by 3%. Uh, employer plans, that was a little surprising. I had to like check my math a couple of times just to make sure because it's been pretty consistently flat for the last four or five years. Um, quite a bit of growth. Uh, I looked at it. Some of it is in the standalone Part D market and some of it is in the, um, in the Medicare Advantage market. So, but that's, uh, I checked that number a bunch of times. That's the, actually the correct number. So 15% growth in the employer plans and about 50-50 split between Part D and Medicare Advantage. This is a, I think this is an interesting slide and this tells you a lot. And um, I think it really complements you in that you're here for our uh, DSNP, uh, some of our DSNP training. Um, but you can see like of the products um, in the MA market, you know, the two products that are growing uh, more than 1%, like everything else is shrinking, is the uh, local PPO product and the special needs product. And look at that growth in special needs. And, you know, before you'd see like 20% growth in special needs plans, but, you know, if it's going from like 1 million to 1.2 million, you know, it's like, well, 200,000. But now as we get more and more of this 20% growth compounding year after year, it's becoming, um, it, it's clearly the third largest and it's like getting close to passing the local PPO as far as a, as far as a product type. So um, hopefully that, that slide gives you some uh, encouragement to focus on special needs, uh, to focus on DSNP, um, and also kind of give you some indication of what's selling as far as HMO versus PPO. Now let's get into the individual carriers. So these are the top 25 carriers. I just included uh, the ones that uh, Ritter Insurance Marketing represents. I didn't show ones that, um, that we don't represent. Um, although I think most of those you can't sell anyway, even if it's with somebody else. Not that you would even want to do that, but, um, <laughs> but they're, not, they're not on this list. So this is kind of an interesting slide. So the numbers themselves, that's a year over year, um, a year over year change. And it's kind of a mix of two things. So, you know, from say from March of 2023 through December of 2023, that's one product category, but then you get into the 2024 benefits as well. So you're kind of blending two product years. So what I do to kind of help you um, divine the difference between what, was, what growth was driven by this AEP just passed and what is kind of like the continuous growth that we got for the lock-in for, uh, for 2023 was to show you the percent change in the annual enrollment period and then the, and then the year over year. So um, just to give you like an example, if you look at United, they're the number one carrier they added over 400,000 enrollments. <clears throat> and you can see that the, major, or the, the bulk or all of that growth in enrollment happened uh, in the year-over-year -year bucket. So that was occurring in 2023. And they were actually pretty much flat during the annual enrollment period. So that growth was really driven by their 2023 year and not really driven by the annual enrollment period. If you look at um, Aetna, CVS Aetna number three, you'll see that they had 29% growth for the full year, but almost all of that occurred during the annual enrollment period. So they actually grew by 25.3% uh, during the annual enrollment period. And then if you go the whole way down to the bottom, you'll see the industry average. So you can see, um, 
obviously a 25% growth number that's kind of jumps off the page, but you know, what was typical for the whole industry about 3% or I'm sorry, 2.7% growth was the average uh, for the industry. So like for IBC and Excellus, uh, even though that number doesn't, you know, compare maybe to a 20% number, it's still faster than the industry average, just to kind of put everything into context. Now let's talk about the uh, Part D market. Um, so this is an interesting slide. <laughs> so there's another number that kind of jumps off the page. Uh, that's the number one carrier. So uh, WellCare became, uh, or oh, those. Oh, I got I got the three years. So WellCare moved into the number one spot, basically uh, flip flop with Aetna uh, for taking over the number one spot, uh, thirty nine point six percent, and added about one and three quarter million members over the over the course of the year. I didn't break out the AEP and the and the full year, but this was um, throughout all of twenty twenty three and into twenty twenty four annual enrollment period drove that growth. I think you all know what plan drove that. If you sell, if you sold WellCare PDP, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I think I'm telling any secrets here, um, but that drove that incredible, almost 40% growth over the year. And keep in mind too, that the, that the market, they grew 40%, the market actually shrank by 3% overall. You can see the next, uh, the next four companies in line, um, CVS, United, Cigna, and Humana. So your top five represent the vast majority of the overall uh, PDP market. And I think that should say six through 31, but the, the, bottom, um, the bottom 25, 26 uh, carriers are roughly about the average of one of the top five carriers is what they do. So so a lot of that business is really focused on, on five different insurance companies. So now we're gonna get into some regional uh, stats. So kind of getting a little bit away from, um, a little bit away from the uh, uh, specific carriers and talking about which states are the fastest growing states. So um, one thing that jumped out to me was that California was always in this top 10 list. So not seeing California was a little bit of a surprise. Um, also Pennsylvania um, jumping up to the number three spot in the, in the country was, uh, was pretty, pretty incredible. It's typically in the seven to 10 range. So moved up substantially. Uh, the other thing is that this group is really bunched up. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of difference um, between you know, number two and number five, it's a pretty, you know, they're pretty tightly bunched together. Uh, so you can see the, the top 10 states and how much production was added um, from December through February of 24. Now let's look at each of these top 10 states. And what I did here for this slide was I showed you um, who were the top four carriers in each state in terms of absolute growth. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at this. You can look at it on a percentage basis. You can look at it over a year. So there's all kinds of different ways to slice and dice this, but uh, just to kind of give you a snapshot of the annual enrollment period, I thought this was a pretty good, this was a pretty good look. Um, you can see um, in a lot of these states, either in the first or second slot, you would see either Aetna or Humana. That was one thing that kind of jumped out. So they both had a good year. Um, United had a good year in Georgia. I saw Devoted pop into this um, for the first time in a, in a long time, or the, kind of the first time uh, outside of like Florida where they were historically really good, but they're starting to show up in a lot more states. But these are the, the top players in absolute growth. Um, one of the things that's a, like maybe a little bit deceiving is if you start off of a ver with a very low base, every single thing you write, you know, so if you have zero members and you get a thousand members, right, then you'll get, you have a thousand, you know, a thousand growth. But if you have start with a hundred thousand members, you're probably going to automatically lose, you know, 
three to 5,000 members just through attrition. So you have to write three or 5,000 just to get to zero. And then, so, you know, you could write 5,000 mem new members. Another plan writes a thousand members and they have more growth than you on this chart. So it's a little, it's a little wonky that way, but there's all kinds of ways to slice it and dice it. And I don't have the persistency numbers uh, for the plan. So I can't really tell you like how many policies that they actually write during the annual enrollment period. But this hopefully gives you a pretty good idea. Then I looked at every other state um, or most of the other states in the country. And I just kind of grouped them. Uh, so this is only the, the number one plan by state. So you can see um, Aetna, United, Anthem, Humana. They all ha uh, had multiple states. Aetna had quite a list there. I don't know, what is that, about 15 or 20? Um, and then a few states that just had, you know, one individual local plan that, that was the leader in their market. So we're going to finish up uh, with our uh, regulatory, legislative, and in industry trends. So every year, this is... Uh, this is something that the insurance companies uh, eagerly await. Uh, this, is the, this is how uh, the Medicare Advantage plans get paid and their increases for 2025. Uh, so this gives us like the first peak, you know, kind of a sneak peek into uh, the reimbursement, what the, you know, what the plans might look like in, uh, in the future. So you can see one thing that historically happens is that when you get the advance notice and then you get the final notice, uh, typically that final notice is 1% to 2% higher uh, than what you see in the, in the advance notice. And insurance companies and Wall Street, they typically like kind of bake that in like, oh, it's this, but it's going to be 2% higher. So they're just like waiting for that final rate announcement to come out. For the first time, I think it happened like once um, <clears throat> once in the last 10 years that the final rate didn't come out higher than the advance notice. So it actually came out exactly the same. And the effective growth rate is probably the most important number uh, on that list. That's the first line. That one actually went down um, in the final notice versus the advance notice. So... The first thing I do when I see this, I knew that this wasn't really a strong, uh, a strong number because I was expecting it to be one or two percent higher when it came out this past Monday. Uh, so the first thing I typically do, and it comes out like after the stock market closes, so it's like after four o'clock on Monday, is when everybody's like hitting refresh on their browser to get the uh, to get the rate notice. Uh, so the first thing I do is I say, I wonder how like the companies liked it or how Wall Street thought they did. So I thought I would share those results with you. So this is actually the closing price on this past Monday and the closing price on Tuesday. Uh, so this is kind of what Wall Street thought of the rate notice. Uh, you can see, you know, those companies that are more, um, have, a, have a larger, um, percentage of their revenue that's affiliated with the Medicare Advantage product, you know, had a bigger, had a bigger cut. And a lot of this, I think, has to do with the fact that there's like expectations out there. So it's not necessarily that the absolute rate, but it's kind of what was expected. And when the unexpected happens, then you see kind of like the stocks being adjusted. Whereas the companies that had less, um, uh, less of their overall portfolio of revenue tied to Medicare Advantage saw like smaller impacts. And one thing that jumped out at me here was that Cigna was not impacted hardly at all. But then you all probably know that Cigna has sold their Medicare Advantage business to HCSC. So that sort of makes sense that they wouldn't really be impacted by the Medicare Advantage, even though they do have a significant amount of Medicare Advantage business today, but that business is being sold in the future. So this is, uh, this is broker commissions um, and the percent change. Um, I was a little bit optimistic last year, so I'm gonna tone down my projection for, for, uh, for the next year, although I was pretty, 
surprised at how big the increase was um, for, uh, for the PDP. Typically, this is driven by um, the final rate notice, which was on the, which was on the last page. Um, this year, or for 2024, we saw a little bit less than a 2% increase. If you go back to, I know you all are taking pictures, but you guys are getting paid this now anyway, so you should know these numbers. <laughs> I go back. Uh, nope, one more. You can see that the effective growth rate is like almost exactly the same in 2024 and in 2025. So my expectation for uh, commissions, which come out the last week of May, is when we learn what our commissions are going to be uh, for 2025. I'm expecting it to be you know, a small increase in line with what we had this past year. Um, so, yep, about one and a half to two and a half percent is what I'm thinking. Um, additionally, and I'm going to have more on this later in my presentation, but there is a uh, CMS did propose um, in their rulemaking to increase initial commissions by $31 one time. Um, so this was in the proposed rule. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, as far as projecting what's going to happen to PDP, we saw a pretty big increase uh, this past year. I think it was 7.8%. We got to $100 and $50 uh, on renewal. Um, I think this could potentially um, continue to increase at a pretty high rate um, in 2025 based on the fact that there's going to be a lot more value, a lot more um, benefits included in the PDP plan than there was based on the change um, in the Inflation Reduction Act um, that's going to occur in January of 25. So let's get into that change. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the changes to the Part D uh, system. So there's going to be uh, a major overhaul in the prescription drug benefit. This affects not only the standalone Part D business, but it also is going to impact Medicare Advantage, which includes prescription drugs. So MAPD, PDP, um, the same regulations uh, affect both of these products. There's going to be an increase uh, in the deductible. So the deductible is going to go to 590 for, uh, for 2025. And then the big change is in 2025, we're going to see a $2,000 cap on the maximum out of pocket. Um, and that is a decrease of about $6,000. So that's a major, uh, that's a major decrease in the, in the out of pocket cost. Now that's maybe a little bit deceptive for me to tell you that it's a decrease, even though it's true, that it's a decrease of $6,000 because current under the uh, current rules, the, uh, the pharmacies will pay quite a bit of the uh, true out of pocket uh, with their cost sharing um, in what we used to call the donut hole, which we did away with. <laughs> so there have been so many tweaks. I'm like trying to keep <laughs> trying to keep which iteration in my head that uh, we're talking about. But that uh, $8,000 true out-of-pocket cost included uh, what was the contribution of the manufacturer um, in order to fill the coverage gap. So it wasn't what people were paying necessarily. So we are going to sunset that coverage gap discount program, uh, which we, I just talked about. So that's no longer. And we're going to have a manufacturer discount program, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit. But from a consumer facing perspective, it doesn't really matter. It looks the same. It looks the same to, to the, your customer regardless. So I'll be getting into the weeds with you a little bit about like the inner workings of how this plan works mostly from the standpoint to kind of explain like what is this impact going to be for my customers uh, for this coming annual enrollment period. <coughs> and then we're going to <coughs> eliminate the coverage gap phase. So we're actually, I think we were at four phases in the Part D benefit. Then we went to three, uh, or I'm sorry, we were at five, then we went to four. Now we're going to three. So we'll just have basically three phases. Um, as of now, we'll have the deductible. Uh, and then we'll have the coverage, and then we'll have catastrophic, where the consumer pays nothing. So it's almost like we're down to two 
phases where the consumer has to contribute. Uh, the deductible, uh, the consumer pays 100%, and then they pay 25% uh, under a standard plan design benefit. Of course, most insurance companies are going to replace the 25% coinsurance with some sort of a copay, um, and leaning it towards preferred uh, preferred brands, you know, more aggressive um, uh, co-pays for drugs where they get either larger rebates or uh, lower cost for that particular drug. So you're not going to necessarily see 25% coinsurance, but that's just the standard benefit that they have to be actuarially equivalent to. And finally, enrollees are going to have the option to pay their out-of-pocket costs uh, in the form of monthly cap payments instead of having to pay everything at the pharmacy at once. So if you have that individual who's going to hit their $2,000 max out of pocket in January, they'll have the option to spread that $2,000 out throughout the full year. So they don't get hit with having to write one check for $2,000. All right, this is an eye chart, but I like this one. This is like my favorite. This is my favorite chart. There's a bunch of charts out there that talk about um, the uh, prescription drug benefit. We're moving from the, the 2024, current law is actually 2024, so that's a little bit out of date. Um, so we're moving from the 2024 to the 2025 um, design. You will, you'll notice that like really the only thing your customer has to be concerned about, so when you're explaining this to your customer, it's you know 100% deductible, 25% coinsurance, initial coverage, hit the $2,000 out of pocket, and then you don't pay anything going forward, right? So it's very simple to explain to a customer. Um, I added a, a lot of detail here, and this is for brands. So it's a little bit different cost sharing as far as the drug manufacturers, if you get into generics, but this is a little bit more detailed because of the brands. But one of the things I wanted to point out to you is um, the amount that the um, Part D plans pay in the catastrophic phase. So if you look at the way it was in 2023, um, that's the thin blue line, the light blue line. Uh, the, the plans paid 15%. Uh, that went from 15% to 20% in 2024. But remember, that was above the $8,000 true out-of-pocket cost, which is roughly about $3,250 for, uh, for a customer. That's just an estimate or guess, kind of. Um, that's, of course, going down. So your, uh, your customers are going to go into the catastrophic a lot faster in 2025 than they did in 2024 and certainly um, in, in prior years. Um, but if you see that light blue bar, it goes from a sliver to a square. <laughs> it's a it's a lot bigger a lot bigger chunk. So the Part D plans are going to now pay 60% of the cost of drugs in the catastrophic phase. Um, the 20% is the manufacturer, um, and then 20% is Medicare. So Medicare went from paying 80% to 20, and the health plans went from 20 to 60 and the manufacturers are picking up the other 20. And of course you see, as I mentioned before, they did away um, with uh, um, that contribution in the coverage gap when we did away with the coverage gap. That's why you have that gr big green bar, 70% in 2023 and 2024. So now it's only gonna be 10% uh, and it's a, over a much smaller uh, period of time. So let's talk about what is this going to do, right? What is the impact? Now, clearly, you're putting a lot more cost um, on the health plan um, to pay for these uh, prescription drugs, right? So you can see um, you're going into the donut, or you go, donut hole. Wow, I've got to <laughs> erase that from my mind. <laughs> you're going into the catastrophic phase very quickly, and the plan's paying 60% of the cost of every dollar. Uh, once you get over that uh, over that two thousand dollar out of pocket, so are the insurance companies going to lose money, um, become unprofitable 
in order to uh, pay for these extra costs. What do you all think? No, they're not. <laughs> it's going to go to the beneficiary. So instead of, basically, instead of the beneficiary paying these costs um, out of pocket, you know, based on their benefits, uh, you know, going through uh, the different coverage, you know, different coverage levels and paying more at the pharmacy in terms of co-pays and so forth, they're going to pay for it in terms of premium. The only way that um, the health plans are going to be able to make uh, all this work is if they increase the premium on the plans. One of the advantages that Medicare Advantage plans have is that they have a lot more tools for cost containment. So one of those, you know, and the, and the, the payment structure is set up differently as well. So um, one thing that they would get um, potentially is they would be getting um, the, uh, the Part B rebate uh, coming back to them uh, based on how they, how they do their bids. So those dollars can be used to lower the Part D prescription drug cost. Um, they can change copays like PCP and specialist, and they can adjust, um, you know, their ancillary benefits like their food cards and things like that. So there's all kinds of moving parts. So generally, an MAPD plan files a much lower bid uh, for their Part D benefit than a standalone PDP, where they have nothing, um, and the prescription drug benefit is reimbursed by the federal government based on an average of all the bids. So the Part D of the Medicare Advantage, along with the standalone uh, Part D, you put all those bids in one bucket, and that's the basis by which the government reimburses the plans. So if you have, uh, if you have MAPD plans filing lower bids um, and you're averaging them out, it's really going to negatively impact the standalone uh, Part D market. Um, Further, when you look at the benchmark, so how does CMS calculate the benchmark for low-income subsidy? Uh, that's based on an average of all the bids, too. So, um, so you have really two factors that are working against the standalone um, Part D plan in terms of, one, them being able to stay with competitive premiums relative to Medicare Advantage, and two, they're it's going to be very difficult for them to maintain their pricing under the benchmark. So in order to get low-income subsidy and to get um, dual eligibles and to be able to get that more favorable cost sharing, your premium for your standalone D plan has to come in under the benchmark. Uh, so these are all factors I think are going to uh, shift the market going forward. So these are kind of the bottom line impacts that I'm seeing based on this. I think one... Medicare uh, MAPD is going to become <clears throat> relatively more competitive compared to Medicare Supplement and PDP. So this is going to create a gradual shift um, in the marketplace. Uh, so then the second factor I see is um, probably somewhere between a $40 and $50 PMPM impact on the standalone PDP market. Um, I don't have any inside information. This is like my best guess. So, I mean, I've talked to actuaries and I still don't feel like maybe they know how big the impact is going to be um, of these changes, but, you know, significant, um, disruptive. I mean, these are kind of all words that are being thrown around. So I kind of like got a general feel that, the, that, you know, we're probably talking in the 40 to $50 range minimum. Um, so this is going to create a continued shift in the market, right? So if you put that kind of pressure on the PDP market, you're going to see a continued impact in a shift of the market away from PDP towards Medicare Advantage. And that's going to just, that's just kind of like a, a ratcheting effect, right? It's almost like a, a downward spiral because the more MAPD you have over here, you know, driving down the price and the fewer Part D plans you have here, it just continues to like kind of tilt the playing field. So it may not be like a one year, but it could be like a multi-year process over time that it's going to be difficult to maintain those lower premiums on the PDP and to stay under the benchmark. And I think each year it's going to get harder and harder unless there's a change in the law. So this is kind of based on like everything else uh, being equal. As far as PDP plans, 
Um, they are going to have pricing pressure based on this change, just this one change in the Part D benefit design. But when you add in um, what's been higher utilization in the fourth quarter of uh, 2023, uh, there have been a number of publicly traded health plans that have announced uh, th that their claims are coming in a little bit higher than what they've expected. Um, and also kind of a little bit of a disappointment on the final rate notice that came out Monday. Um, it's gonna be difficult, I think, for the Medicare Advantage plans to maintain their benefits um, in 2025. So uh, that probably just means like some changes across the board, right? Some degradation in benefits across the board to be able to pay for this 40 to $50 uh, per month for an enhanced Part D benefit and also to account for higher claims and not as good reimbursement as we were expecting. So I'm gonna take a drink now before I get into this one. <laughs> and I, I wish I had something other than water maybe, <laughs> but this is what I have. <laughs> so CMS um, proposed the rule um, I think it came out in November last year. It's usually I call it my Christmas present from, from CMS. It was maybe like a Thanksgiving present th this year. Um, but really, I'm, I'm going to focus. It did a number of things, but I'm going to spend uh, most of my time focused on one area, uh, which is changes to um, agent broker compensation, and in particular focused on um, administrative payments, um, you know, and payments to agents, agencies, FMOs uh, that were considered administrative. Um, so the change that CMS proposes to um, prohibit any contract terms that could be reasonably expected to inhibit an agent from um, being able to objectively assess or recommend a plan that best meets their customer's needs. So the theory here um, from CMS is that if you have you know, two health plans and one, they're both paying you the maximum CMS commission, but on one plan you might get $100 or $150 to do an HRA, and on the second plan you're not getting paid to do an HRA, um, that payment could steer you to you know, enroll somebody in, in that plan based on that HRA payment. So, um, so there's, you know, clearly there's some, and other examples would be like uh, marketing allowance. So, you know, the health plan may be paying, you know, one plan might be paying a certain amount of marketing money and another plan would be paying a different lower amount of marketing money. So um, it would create a disincentive or um, it would kind of create a little bit uh, to put you in a position where, like, am I selling this plan because it's the right plan for the customer or am I selling it because I get the most marketing money by selling this plan? So certainly, you know, understanding that um, where CMS is coming from um, in that regard, uh, things like leads. And then they also they included admin fees and overrides um, as part of the as part of the administrative uh, payments. So getting a little bit into the weeds here maybe, but um, when CMS set the standard rates for, uh, for agents and brokers, and then every year they put out the new rates at the end of May, uh, we get the, we'll get the rates for 2025. Um, there's a regulatory framework within, um, within CMS that allows them to pay um, agents, agencies, brokers for things that are other than enrollment services. Um, but they're allowed to pay them on a per enrollment basis. So like an admin fee for an FMO or an override for a GA or an MGA and so forth, they're treated in that regulatory framework exception. That is what allows CMS to make that payment. So what CMS is proposing is to eliminate the regulatory framework, which allows health plans to pay fair market value for admin services on a per enrollment basis. So basically, that would do away with uh, that would do away with admin fees, marketing dollars, HRAs, any kind of compensation um, that would be um, could induce an agent to write one plan versus another plan. Um, CMS did propose 
to give $31 one time um, to cover all the administrative costs um, borne by the agent. So they looked at like call recording, you know, some of the things that FMOs provide, you know, Ritter provides for you now, like uh, quote tools and CRM and uh, call recording. And I think, I don't think they got much further than that, but that was kind of where they stopped and, you know, said that all those services would be worth $31 and no renewal. So a $31 one-time payment. And then it would add that to the broker commission for 2025 on initial commissions only. So where are we today? Well, we do expect CMS. So if you saw me like looking at my phone and refreshing my browser, I am on the CMS news uh, news page. <laughs> that's where my that's where my phone is at. Right, it's been for the past week. Uh, we were expecting it to come out this week. Uh, we were expecting it to come out Monday, um, but definitely this week is kind of what the expectation is. So. Um, spending a lot of time talking about something, you know, would be uh, quite a significant change to our industry. Like every um, every insurance product that's sold in the United States is sold under this kind of hierarchical system that Medicare uses. So, and CMS is proposing to like make Medicare the only insurance that you can't have uh, you can't have uplines or you can't have uh, FMOs. So yeah, if, if you took a strict interpretation and they finalized the rule as proposed, it would eliminate the current payment for all agencies who receive overrides like GAs, MGAs, SGAs, FMOs, and it would also eliminate any HRA lead or marketing reimbursements that could be paid to agents. So that's the bottom line on that rule. So uh, what are some of the implications? Like any FMO support would have to either fall onto um, the agent or onto the health plan. So I just listed out kind of some of the things that uh, that are involved. Um, compliance training, electronic enrollment, status tracking, commission payments, override payments, all that, call recording, uh, just general broker support. Um, so if you think about like, if this went to, you know, where would this these services go? Like from the standpoint of larger plans, like your national plans would have, in a lot of cases, have a lot of these uh, services and technology already built. But from the agent, from your perspective as agent, you would have to go to each individual carrier and get basically like their view of, you know, their kind of narrow view. So if you represented more than one company, then you'd have to go to each individual company to get like a little slice of your business, you know, a slice of, of the view of your business. A lot of regional and local plans don't have these kinds of services that they offer. So, um, so they would either have to build them themselves, but even if they did, then it would still be just a sliver of your overall business. So you'd be going in, you know, three to five different directions to get the information that you can get all in one place. Finally, if you had a new plan or an expansion of an existing plan, like I'm not sure who's gonna, how you would find them, <laughs> you know, because like agent recruiting is, you know, something that we do, um, and it's uh, probably not something that that carriers are used to doing. So, like, how to get like the recognition for a new plan um, or an expansion of an existing plan would be quite difficult for the health plans to do. <clears throat> so, some of the possible outcomes. Spending a lot of time on something that hopefully we'll know in like the next 24 to 24 hours or so. Um, one, I think, possible outcome is that CMS would delay implementation past 2025. Um, this wouldn't be a great result, but it would be probably better than the worst result. So that's kind of where where I put it. I'd like it to be decided, but um, um, but that's one possible outcome. Uh, CMS was making changes to uh, to kind of how health plans did risk adjustment, um, and these these changes got delayed for years and years and years. They just kept getting kind of pushed down the road. So it doesn't always happen that CMS um, would implement something, especially since we're only you know a few months away from kind of the start of preparing for the 2025 uh, plan year. 
and CMS still hasn't really told anyone what the kind of what the landscape is is going to look like. And you know, then you also have like the election year politics that might be involved too. That if it's a disaster, they may not or they may want to just kick the can down the road for a year. So that's one possibility. A finalization with uh, with modifications. Um, this is what I think is probably probably the most likely. Um, I sound real confident there. <laughs> probably the most likely. <laughs> I think it might be the most likely. Uh, that's kind of where I landed. What where they would still allow payments for admin fees, but there could be caps, or uh, they could eliminate HRAs, or it could be capped, or they could bundle marketing allowances into admin fees and put a cap on that. So, um, you know, changing definitions. Like right now, the way CMS thinks about a TPMO is really uh, a third-party marketing organization. But like whether you're a call center or whether you're um, an FMO or even an agent, everybody is kind of painted with the same brush. So where a lot of these problems didn't really come from the agent community, maybe it came from more from the call center community, like CMS is treating everybody pretty much the same. So that's kind of where we're, uh, where there's a hope that maybe CMS would like more precisely define their, you know, who's participating in the in the system and who's where the problems are coming from. And then the last one would be if CMS finalizes the rule as they proposed it with like little to no changes. Um, so in this case, there would be no opportunity to um, receive any kind of um, payments based on enrollment, but there could be other alternate payment methods based on like vendor relationships. So there could be some doors that, that open even though that door closes, but we don't really know what that looks like yet. And there could be litigation involved as well, um, which would probably be based on if CMS has the authority um, to regulate administrative payments um, and call them compensation. So there's a bunch of legal questions. I don't know kind of what all those answers are, but um, at least I think by hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow, we'll know uh, at least where CMS stands. And then we get to interpret that. <laughs> and that's like a whole nother bunch of months uh, process to like, you know, just you think you know things like when CMS puts out the guideline, but sometimes there's more questions than there are answers uh, in the in the final rule. So we'll kind of see how that goes. And then finally, want to talk a little bit about the FCC uh, changes to uh, lead generation. So a lot of this has to do with um, comparison websites um, and other um, lead generators um, that aggregate leads uh, and then sell those leads to third parties. Uh, so currently, um, if an individual goes onto a comparison site, they can basically check a box that says, I authorize a uh, third party to contact me, but there's actually no limit on how many times that lead can be sold to the third party. So what the, um, and this is final rule now, the final as of January. Um, so what the final rule says now is that um, you can only sell that lead to one third party. Um, now you could potentially do more than one third party, but there'd have to be like a checkbox or something. So there'd have to be like a list of third parties and the consumer would theoretically be like checking 10 boxes so that they can get 10 phone calls about the same thing, which I don't really think they're going to do. Like, I don't think I would do it. I'd just say, just have the best person call me, <laughs> you know, and then I'll just talk to them. I don't need to talk to 10 people, but, um, but that's the, uh, that's the regulation. This is not going to go into effect until January of 2025. Um, so only one identified seller can communicate with the, co with the consumer, um, really going to be a significant change for the lead aggregators and lead generators, um, in that landscape. So this might've been helpful for us actually, if it, they put this into effect, because I think a lot of the complaints that Medicare beneficiaries had was that they were getting continuously called, you know, they put in their information on one site and then they their phone would ring like eight seconds later, and then it would stop ringing like eight weeks after that. So it's quite a quite a process. 
So now I'm going to close with uh, some Medicare trends. And this is a little bit of a recap. Let's see how I'm doing for time. Pretty good. Um, a recap of like kind of everything that we talked about, but just trying to bring it all together of kind of what I see the annual enrollment period looking like this year. So you saw the current year uh, growth trends projections um, for the uh, commission rates. Like I do feel like the prescription drug plans are going to grow like either strong single digits, maybe even double digits, because it is a substantial increase uh, in the benefits on that. Um, and then med subcommissions would be just be flat, continue to be percentage. So looking at product uh, benefits for next year, uh, I'm thinking it's going to be uh, flat to degrading um, for Medicare Advantage benefits for uh, 2025 and, you know, continuing um, increases in complexity. So um, I think this could come in like two dimensions. Um, one would be as far as as far as the degrading the benefits could be just like, you know, actual changes to the benefit, right? So like instead of a zero PCP copay, you have a $5 PCP co copay. That's pretty simple. I think the other level of changes that we could see for 2025 would be you have the same benefit, but it may be harder to access that benefit. <laughs> you know, there may be more gatekeepers or more ways that, you know, well, I don't know if hoops or, you know, that if you had the $2,000 dental benefit, you know, you have to go through these, you know, but there's 200 for this and 400 for that. And it's capped at this per quarter. And, you know, you have all kinds of other gatekeepers that limit that. So those are kind of the two ways I see um, Medicare Advantage potentially changing. Um, for Part D, seeing um, potential disruption, uh, seeing pretty large um, premium increases based on those large benefit increases uh, in that product. So um, Medicare supplement, you know, based on the above average uh, claims rates that we saw in Q4, you know, expecting something in the 6 to 8% um, increases. <laughs> now, sometimes it takes a while for those increases to get baked into uh, Medicare supplement, but like that's, I think, is the trend I'm seeing going forward. So Overall, looking at a huge increase in consumer demand for agents to help them. I think there are going to be a lot of people that are surprised by their ANOC letters. Um, and I think our job is going to be to try to get you prepared before those ANOCs go out to have your customers ready to kind of know the landscape, know the conversations you're going to have. And I can just imagine uh, you have a PDP member, they're paying... $30 a month for their Part D plan, and they get their ANOC letter, and they go to $80, or they go to $90 a month. And they, they call you, right? <laughs> and maybe that plan is the best plan for them still, but, you know, you're going to spend about 30 minutes, you know, with the phone, like, out, you know, three feet from your ear, hearing about how, you know, insurance companies are ripping them off, and, that you know, so you're going to spend 30 minutes on the phone as therapist and then, you know, run the benefits, run the, you know, do the, the estimation and say, yeah, that's still your best plan, you know, and no, nothing actually happened. So, I mean, I can kind of foresee those types of things happening. Um, I can also see like opportunities where, you know, people are going to be shopping probably more than ever, more than I can ever remember because, you know, when they do get those, big changes in price is when that's what prompts them to want to talk to somebody to want to like shop their plan, shop their market. So, um, so it is going to be kind of a, I call this year a tale to a tale of two cities, right? It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. So like we had the best year ever <laughs> together with enrollment, you know, over 120,000 enrollments and over 30% growth during the annual enrollment period. And then we get, you know, a proposed rule from CMS. And, um, you know, these changes are going to be painful. It's going to take a lot of education and a lot of time on our agents' behalf to be able to explain it uh, to their customers. But we'll create opportunities as well where there's going to be more people shopping, I think, than I can ever recall 
um, be, because they're going to have that kind of sticker shock based on those changes in their plans. So, uh, so that's the, the best of times and worst of times speech. Again, want to say thanks to everyone for coming out. I mean, hopefully, uh, hopefully you found this, uh, this interesting. If you want to give me a hand, by all means.